Well, hey, everybody, it's Lisa from True North, and today I am joined by BJ Preman, who is one of our amazing teachers at True North Homeschool Academy. So BJ, hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> we both live in sunny South Dakota, and it's like, I think it's on like um, 14 or 16 inches right now of snow. It's crazy. It's yep. just crazy. Yeah. So this is winter break. <laughs> winter has hit. Um <laughs> Uh, so we are going to start classes again on Monday and BJ, you teach kind of an interesting grouping of classes. You teach art one and two video editing, form and color, earth and space. And what am I missing? I feel like you teach an, oh, an executive functioning skills. Is that all of them? I think so. Okay. I think so. <laughs> okay. So I want to, I want to let everybody, if they don't know you, I want to give them a little bit of background on you because you are an artist and you're a speed painter with an international ministry. You've traveled around the world doing speed painting, which is a whole thing unto itself. <laughs> I'll link the podcast <laughs> where you talk about it in there. Cause it's so fascinating to me, but you're also trained as a scientist and that's kind of an interesting. Yeah. Topic, though. <laughs> so tell us about your training and stuff. It can seem a little counterintuitive. Um, I grew up loving animals and loving art, mm -hmm. and I, I had an uncle who was a vet, and that was a very big inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to school for vet tech, which is a bachelor's of science major, and I love the lab work and the getting down in the nitty gritty, and I, I loved animal dissection. I do know more than one way to skin a cat. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's, that's <laughs> awesome and also kind of gross. <laughs> a little bit, um, but a lot of the sciences are. Uh, I, uh, and that, that's what I pursued. And then sometimes God puts your life on a different track. And that's what happened with me pretty early on in my marriage with my husband. And uh, we discovered homeschooling. And it was there that my art skills, which were self-taught, really started to come into play. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's my oldest is 15. So here we are 15 years later down the art track. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. You've been teaching for True North and, but you teach for local co-ops in class days too. So you've yes. been teaching art for a very long time, haven't you? Yes. So art since, hold on, I have to do math in my head. <laughs> Probably around um, 2011, which included both um, painting, sketching, um, the uh, theater. Um, actually, I uh, worked as a um, theater camp teacher for a special needs camp uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, yeah, it just kind of morphed from small co-ops to multiple co-ops to teaching classes of volunteer through like, like youth centers and then true north <laughs> awesome awesome um it, and, and i love your classes that you teach at true north because you teach technique and you teach a media um uh well am i saying it right you teach a technique in your art classes um in art one and two a technique a week and then a medium a week is that how it goes well, sort of, we try to focus on um, sketching skill sets one week and then watercolor skill sets one um, one week mm -hmm. uh, and provide balance. Sometimes we'll do both in one class, but it can also be a lot to hold in your head when you're just learning how to really attack shading or the different types of um, forming gesture in the human body. Uh, and then also everything having to do with color theory and then other things that are a little more abstract, yeah. which is one of the things I love about art. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk a lot about, um, here's the classic high school scenario or sometimes junior high, depending where your kid's at. Why do I have to learn algebra? I'm never going to use it. Right. <laughs> which is true for the vast majority of human beings. We don't need to use algebra in our adult day-to-day -day lives. Uh, but the scientific teacher answer to that is because it helps your brain grow. It's going to help everything developing up here mm -hmm. um, progress better than if you don't train your brain to work hard mm -hmm. at this skill set. Right. Um, and the same is true for the abstract concepts and visual concepts in art. And it, it doesn't really get um, talked about that way, mm -hmm. uh, but the the it's the opposite side of the coin you've got really strong math science kids put them in an art class yeah. get their brains thinking in a more visual tangible it's geometric um way 
and you are going to support everything on that math calculating very black and white yeah. side. Yeah. I when you're talking, I remember this old Leonardo da Vinci video set we had that we actually used for homeschooling. And it was really talking about the life of Leonardo and how he would do a lot of dissection, but he drew everything and he would do these very detailed drawings and um of of the things that he was dissecting, even human bodies. And but now we're just so we're so categorized, you know, like arts over here. If you're an art minded person, you do that. But if you're a science person, you do this. And I think it's a dichotomy that is kind of unnatural because art and science really do seem to go together in my mind anyway. They do. They yeah. really do. Uh so um and it's kind of like a well-roundedness. So like back in the, like, say, Regency area, you had this concept of a well-rounded young man or young woman, which involved multiple languages, um, what mathematics were considered standard at the time, and art and music. So you had this really complete picture of everything available in the educational scheme. And then as society grew and developed and industry developed, we learned that financially we'd be in a better place when you specialized in something. So that concept of well-roundedness sort of fell to the backside. And I feel like sometimes um, it's gone, it goes too far. And mm -hmm. while like in college, you, you really want to specialize if you're going to be <laughs> going to college, like, yeah, focus on whatever X, Y, Z is. But at the high school, junior high level, um, that well-roundedness, again, going back to that um, growth and development of the brain and problem solving, kids need that. Right. Development needs that. Yeah, right. And I do, I do think like the, the skills of sketching. Um, so I've heard this for a long time. Like I just, I'm not, I'm just not good at that, but it's a skill set that you can actually learn to be better skill at. Set. And it gets so practice. Like, yes. Yeah. It's like and, multiplication tables. It's you yeah. just practice it and you do get better. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it can be like journaling. I think for a lot of people, they journal to get all the stuff out of their head so that they can think more clearly and get stuff done. And that's how sketching and art can be for people too, if they have the skills Absolutely. to do it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And even, and even if they don't have the skill to do yeah. it, um, you look at the type of curriculums that have been formatted in the arts, like the anatomy coloring books that support yeah textbooks because having that visuality just it, it expands what you're reading yeah. so much it helps reinforce and art is a great reinforcement mm -hmm. class for I mean you're talking about anatomy you're talking about zoology um, biology uh, you talk about I mean even um, you, you mentioned journaling and that cathartic yeah. uh, philosophy yeah. <laughs> psychology yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Um, how do you feel like the arts have expanded the growth that you've seen with your students? Because you probably have seen the broad spectrum at this point, from the really artistically, naturally inclined artistic kids to the like, I don't want to do this kids. <laughs> yes, I've had uh, some of both. Uh, <laughs> and now this applies mostly like I, the kids who like want to run with it. I usually have for multiple classes. So I do get to see a progression, not only over one school year, but usually two or three. Um, I've had a couple of students this year who are on their third year of my three different art courses that I teach that are like, are you going to teach something new next year? And I'm like, well, no, <laughs> we need to talk sorry, about <laughs> but we'll figure something out. <laughs> yeah. um, so you get to see this multi-year growth in a student. And um, that relationship gets a lot more relational relational than just the student teacher relation. Um, Art is a great way for engaging with students because, um, you know, when they when they're in a bad mood, um, you can notice like stuff gets um, like physically darker. They're not hitting pastels. Yeah. <laughs> when they're mad at something, well, that's and right. trying to like process it. Yeah. Um, it also is a great look into um, the brain. As and I've been being that I'm starting with this executive functioning class. Um, here's something I can give you from art perspective, learning about my own son. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of ADHD, both inattentive and active in my family. Mm -hmm. So um, we, uh, with my son in particular, he gravitates towards black and white so much. Like he actually, he, he really resistant, like barely did anything when it came to colors and his assignments with watercolor and painting. He didn't like crayons as a he wanted black and white art because for him 
that makes the most sense. That's what he gravitates to is when there's not shades of gray. And and that's how his mind works. He doesn't like ambiguity. He likes specific instructions. He wants um, instructions written down. He doesn't want to hold a list in his head verbally. He's like, I will forget it. I can't like, I need the black and white in yeah. front of me. And uh -huh. you see it in what art he likes to draw and what he gravitates to. That is interesting. I have never thought about that before. Very fascinating. Hmm. Just colors. Wow. And how different. Yeah, I'm going to have to think about that. That's very interesting. So how, how about kids who, how do you develop a kiddo like that? I mean, do you feel like there's, there's really, um, there's benefit to helping him develop beyond black and white or kids who are like him? Yes. Yes, there is. On one hand, you, you don't want to squelch what they're gravitated to because you want them to practice what they like because that's what they're going to get better at the fastest and you don't right. want to like squash that side of a skill set. But it's making him do things that involve the color wheel or I'll have him come and I'm like, we'll be doing stuff with my six or seven year old and, um, you know, easy, fun, messy yeah. <laughs> color stuff. <laughs> and I was like, come do this with us. And he ends up making stuff that's fantastic, even though he's doing it begrudgingly. Like, I'm just like, it's family time. Just do the thing. I don't care what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. And it's just good for them to think in that sort of methodology. Because again, he's trying to think, all right, I'm, we're drawing popsicles. I need to make an orange, but not like too dark because it's an ice cream. And he's thinking like that orange sickle pop from like <laughs> the sports yeah. pan yeah. that they sell. And um, so he has to figure out how to make that color, especially as a teenager who does not want to ask for mom's help. And it makes his brain think in a way where he would normally never have to approach mm -hmm. thinking about that thing. Or, right. uh, And that's always a benefit. It's always a benefit when you can put any sort of problem in front of a kid and be like, figure it out. Yeah. And it's okay if they don't want to figure it out by themselves. That's what art class is for. I will guide you on your journey. <laughs> right. Exactly. But you love to see them struggle through something mm -hmm. and succeed in it. That, right. um, you know, that personal struggle, not to the point where they're defeated, but where they're like, okay, okay, okay. I did the thing. And that's great. <laughs> I love it. You're really talking about building resiliency in kids by giving them kind of an artistic problem to solve. I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize that art is a critical thinking skill set. Like if you're, if you're an artist and you're like, I threw pottery for quite a long time, um, way like decades ago, <laughs> like way, way be, be before, you know, anytime recent. But I think a lot of people don't realize that if you're doing any kind of like um, production or trying to get to a certain look in your picture or with clay or any kind of medium, you have to really critically think through it and problem solve it. Or if you do something in it and it didn't work out with clay, it's an easiest one. Um, if your if your pot cracks or the handle doesn't stick, well, how do you solve through those problems? It's really critical thinking skills that you're building in the kids. And I it love is. that what your example is all about resiliency, like just wrestle through the problem. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it's a benefit to kids. And it, it's even in the way that I teach. Uh, so right now in both art and art two, um, in one and two, we always start the new year off with um, drawing dragons. Uh, mm -hmm. It's so, cause we always throw a little bit of fantasy creature. You can teach so much biology off a of fantasy creature. Cause we're studying like the different types of scale types on snakes and lizards oh, and nice. teeth design. And you, you get that like, oh. Okay, mm -hmm. here's how I'm teaching you real things, but we're using this fake thing. So mm -hmm. dragons, allegorical in all ways, shapes, and sizes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to say, all right, you need to make this dragon's head more exactly this way so it looks like mine. I'm like, you're going to start with a triangle, right? And then you're going to refine a shape. And it's kind of it's better if it doesn't look exactly like mine. Like we have reference. What we always draw with reference? You never want to be like forcing a kid to like just imagine something out of thin air yeah. and then um, make it 3D and then make it 2D because that's a lot of mental work, although yeah. you can eventually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, interesting. But you want that individuality and that personal problem solving to come into play with it a little bit so you want to like give guidance here's what we're drawing here's a picture of it if you need me to draw the way this wing is shaped eight times in a row with my my desk camera I will do that mm -hmm. but I try to always reinforce that it's okay if it doesn't look exactly like mine or exactly like this student over here's because 
art in particular, it, you're all going to be the, the range of skill sets is vast. Like you get yeah. into like eighth grade math and most of those kids are going to be in this realm of seventh to ninth grade mm -hmm. math levels in eighth grade math. Right. Um, but with art, you have the kid who um, like they get it, they get shapes, they get color, and they produce a lot of fantastic stuff that's already at a level that like I would be teaching, like that I work at yeah. all the way down to like, I draw stick figures and I would like to learn how to draw more than stick figures. You get that all in one class. Mm -hmm. And so you're teaching to a much broader range. So the idea of this is not comparative, life should not be comparative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I really try to reinforce that through two, because it's an individualized journey and you are at where you're at and take pride in what you're learning and don't look over here and be like, but because it doesn't look like this, I am therefore a failure. Mm -hmm. We want to knock that in the bud yeah. right away. And so art, there it's kind of like there, you have a psychological philosophical aspect yeah. to art reinforcing healthy mental attitudes uh, mm -hmm. about the kid for themselves. Yeah. I love that you don't just tell the kids draw something and give them a blank sheet of paper and they have to pull it out of their head because I think I think that is so difficult for a lot of children. They just and, and adults too. Um, but giving them a reference and saying, here's what it could look like, and then they can modify it. And then as they grow and develop, then they can start being more creative and imaginative on their own. It's just like if you're learning music, you start with scales. You don't just say compose something. You give them the tools to compose yes. with. And that's what you're yes. doing with art classes is you're, you're giving them those composition tools. Definitely. And I really want to like, you always have to emphasize with them with tools. Like, can I, is tracing cheating? Um, like if you're tracing and then claiming you didn't trace, that's cheating. But tracing is a tool. Copying is a tool. There's a phrase, yes. steal like an artist. Oh, I love that. <laughs> you're going to draw inspiration from so many places. Um yeah. And, and so many, and you, to get good, you have to do what we call just artist studies, where you study a specific style of an artist. And if you have to trace them a whole bunch to get that pattern of like line work in your head, like we're going to be doing Alphonse Mucha in um, Form and Color and that Art Nueva. And, and he just had this fantastic, like pastel-y, um, soft feminine style. And uh, we're going to throw that into... Um, form and color in like all of January and focus on his style as we teach how do we draw movement and uh, in body parts how do we place things in a realistic manner with proportion mm -hmm. um, and some kids will love his style and some kids won't and that's totally fine um, but the point is steal it as much as you need to get better at it and incorporate it into how you do what you do mm -hmm. you don't need to become the next Picasso or Rembrandt you need to be the first you when it comes yeah. to your art and yeah. you're going to draw inspiration from a lot of places to do that and that's okay you yeah. can copy other people's work you can trace their work just as long as you're not lying about what you're producing you know mm -hmm. that those are fantastic tools for yeah. learning how to do whatever concept and art you're focusing on at the time I love it I love it and in that same way in some ways what you're talking about with science art supports the science in kind of that same way, because it's not like you're, you're not recreating whatever it is you're drawing. You're just supporting the learning in a different layer, I guess is a better way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, a really, really literal example of that is when I was in college, I had this lab teacher. He was great. And he, he understood students like me who like had to keep their hands busy. Uh -huh. As if my hands weren't busy, I probably wasn't listening. If the hands are busy, my attention is on you. If my hands are not busy, my brain is like a thousand miles <laughs> away. Yeah. So he never like scolded or like called out the fact that I was usually doodling even during tests. And in fact, um, he would give me extra credit on quizzes and tests if I drew anatomically correctly, whatever bacteria group we were studying or you know, whatever cell group like um he found a way and good teachers do this um to incorporate the way my brain worked into my education yeah. and art does that so well for a lot of students uh mm -hmm. you talk about like artist illustration in medical textbooks and botany books and uh i know a couple um he's a surgeon and she's an artist and that's what he does he designs to specialized tools for surgery and patents them and she draws them she wow. like diagrams everything out it's like the best duo you've ever seen in the sciences and the arts that's awesome um, <laughs> oh. 
So they, they definitely build on top of each other, especially because when it comes to memory work and repetition, mm -hmm. if you can, you can repeat something verbally as many times as you want and write it down as many times as you want. Those things are helpful. But when you can abstract out and draw that concept, like, okay, this is a mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to help yourself in a much um, more lasting way. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Are you, are, do you still do science? I mean, are you teaching science or do you work part-time as a scientist or tell us? About <laughs> no, I, I could tell my husband, like, I might go back into like the vet tech world, like as my um, after children career, you know, like they fly the nest yeah. and you're like, now what do I do with my life? Which I'm kind of looking at, like he's 15. Yeah. Uh, but I'm like, it's soon, it's happening soon. And he's going to be out there yeah. and then it's going to be gone. I'm like, what am I going to do with my time? But, uh, yeah, because uh, I love it. I do. Yeah. But you can, it's you're allowed to have more than one passion. Yeah. Which exactly. you're allowed to have as many as you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we we yeah. don't live in an era where um you go into work at like this is your career and you are stuck in it for yeah. the next fifty years. Um and, and employers find that annoying in one hand because especially people like millennial and younger tend to job hop a lot. Um, um, and while that is understanding to be annoying for an employer as, as an individual, as a person, like it, it's okay, explore yeah. lots of things and, yeah. you know, find what you're good at and you might like more than them and having multiple interests converge. That's how you create new products, new business, <laughs> new yeah. opportunities for yourself. Exactly. I, I, I do a lot of reading on the future of like, what's just going to happen in the future and people are going to live longer, which means they're going to have multiple careers. So it's going to be really common for people to start a whole different second or third or fourth or fifth career in their sixties, even, you know, because people are going to live longer because healthcare is so much better and our quality of life is better. So that's interesting to think about, but I love the whole idea. I mean, art can bring all that together for people because it's teaching you to think outside the box. It's teaching you to explore and discover and push the envelope a little bit better in kind of a safe controlled way. I mean, um, it's, yes. it's not like racing a car at 120 miles an hour, you know, <laughs> you can push the envelope without like endangering yourself <laughs> most of the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. So what is your, who's your favorite artist I have to ask? <laughs> oh man. So I love Rembrandt because I like dark moody art and he's kind of the king of the dark moody portrait. <laughs> like anytime you see a piece of art where like it's all the shadows and there's little square of light on like one side of the cheek, that's either Rembrandt or Rembrandt inspired. And I love that dark moodiness. <laughs> um, I, uh, that's so hard. That's like <laughs> such a hard question to ask an artist. That's like asking an artist who makes abstract art, but what does it mean? <laughs> Don't ask them that. Okay, tell, us, mean to you? Of, tell us a couple more of your favorites. We got Rembrandt. Uh, Rembrandt, I, I like um, Salvador Dali and his weirdness and um, abstractness. And it, he has this photograph, and I forget the actual name of it, but it's one where he, there's holding a chair and there's water and there's a cat flying through the air. Um, and it's just put random things together. And it's interesting to look at. And you would say, oh, I'm going to take a picture of some water and a chair and a cat. And it's right. going to be in black and white. And that sounds, I mean, honestly, as a describe, as described, then really boring. But like the chair was like held by a guy this way, one way. And then someone's throwing the water. Someone threw the cat. Like wow. they didn't get a cat to jump. Someone threw the cat into the scene. It was fine, just in case anyone's wondering. Yeah. <laughs> so that they could get these weird arches and organic shapes and movement. Uh, and I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Wow, I'm going to have to go look up that picture. <laughs> okay, one more, one more artist. One more. Okay, okay. Um, So this is an artist that I don't necessarily like because I love their um style of painting the most but their attitudes towards it um and hold on here I'm gonna oops sorry I'm having a little bit of a tech problem on my side and I'm gonna fix it and then we're gonna keep talking <laughs> <laughs> um nope 
my computer's like, hey, do you want to restart to like reload this thing? I'm like, no, 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 don't do oh, that right now. Not right now. <laughs> don't, don't do that right now. Okay, we're good. Um, Monet. Monet. And it, oh, he's hmm. sort of the father of um, impressionism. Yeah. Um, so not worrying about line work and fine details, but I, I, it's, he's not like my favorite painter ever, but his attitude towards everything. So the, um, he painted the water lilies in 1919. Like wow. or like they were finished. So it's a huge series of paintings, and um, they're massive. And during the period of time that he was painting them, which were all inspired by his backyard garden, wow. um, World War One was going on. The dude lived in France, and everyone around him evacuated. And he's like, "No, I'm old." I'm just going to sit here and paint my water lilies and wow. it'll probably be fine. And it was, he like, just didn't oh. care. <laughs> like, this is That's just what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw one of his paintings at the Chicago museum of art. It is, they're huge. They're very big paintings. Huge. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I, you just got to respect that. Like he entrepreneured, people hated it. Art critics hated it when he and his group of impressionists first started showing their art. Yeah. Um, they got so much just shade thrown their way. And then by the end of his lifespan, um, you had artists like Picasso. So like Monet and Picasso overlap. People don't realize like history can be taught through art in such like yeah. a fantastic way. Picasso was this up and coming artist and it was so abstract and weird. And here's Monet, a master who fought his whole life was the basis for the abstract work that Picasso did. And everyone just hated Monet's work by the end because Picasso was so much shinier and new. And <laughs> <laughs> the dude just had to live through so many attitudes of discouragement, literal bombs from falling from that's the sky. Crazy. And he's like, I'm just going to keep painting. And wow. that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, it's so interesting to me to hear the stories behind the painters because it just shows, I mean, you can see it in their art once you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so fascinating. Yeah. yeah, it's a great way to teach history. Such a great way to teach history. What is your favorite thing about teaching art, especially from a science background? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're really coming at art from a unique perspective in my, from what I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess just the push for students to think more than skin deep when it comes to how they portray things. So mm -hmm. on one sense, you're taking an object that an, a student knows is 3D. Like it's like, we're going to draw a person. Mm -hmm. you, your brain knows that's a 3D shape, which is why it's frustrating when you put it onto a piece of paper and you have a 2D format, how do we make it look 3D again? Mm -hmm. um, so you're fighting against um, your perception of mm -hmm. space. Yeah. And um, and then, especially in anatomical art, so with animal drawing that we're doing in art one and two and uh, form and color, which is anatomical drawing, figure drawing, um, you have to think about, okay, well, what's the shape of things underneath the clothes? Because so often clothes look wrong because you're not drawing the body with clothes on, you're just drawing a shirt and you're not thinking about the body underneath it. And why does the body look like that? Well, um, we always draw muscular skull, um, s muscles like at some point um, skin off like okay here's how um, they turn into tendons and this is what the joints look so we'll do an arm or legs or something or shoulder mm -hmm. muscles because I want students to learn there's always layers there's a why something looks like that it's 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 not just I'm going to invent it out of my head there's a reason a muscle sculpts this way there's a reason the skin lays this way over a rib cage so there's a reason the shirt looks like this mm -hmm. on a male versus um like an adult male versus um a teenage boy a young teenage yeah. boy like there's physical reasons for that and you have to think about the layers um so i it's one way of teaching like the scientific approach yeah. there's a why you create a theory and you gotta test that and you gotta evaluate and then see if you're right mm -hmm. and so building thought processes is so mm -hmm. important in yeah. achieving skill sets in art just and that's just with drawing a figure that's not even with painting it like then you've got to do it all again like okay so this is skin and what does even skin tone mean and undertones and are they sunburnt are they flush are they exercising <laughs> does it need to be redder or they have a tan it just needs to be browner how do we handle shadows right. and layer and layer and analytical thinking yeah, that, all that goes into that. And I love that aspect of art so much, which I, I think is heavy from the science side, because yes, I want to look at that under a microscope and see what it's doing and and why it's doing it. <laughs> uh, and so it. art for me it. the same way. 
you, you are talking about so many different brain processes as you're talking. I mean, I'm just thinking the executive functioning ties in so well here because you're teaching kids to think critically about, you know, what you see isn't always what you get. What you see is just one layer and boy, our world needs that so much right now. Everybody's just taking everything at face value and an offense is like a, like a hobby right now. <laughs> um, but if yeah. we can just like learn to see behind the layers, it can just open up whole new worlds of understanding. So I love that. That's just such a big part of what you're teaching the kids, not just how to draw the cup, but why does it move and look and, and sound and think like, the, you know, a cup's a terrible example, but a cat, maybe. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. You're actually having those conversations with the kids because Art is everywhere, and um, and they're in the, they're in the very act of the creative process by getting up and living every day, and so you're giving them real life skills through art. It's it's terrific. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, anything else? I mean, well, we've covered a lot. I I do think the arts really expand <laughs> growth, and I love how you brought in the scientific method because this. I just feel like. <laughs> All, all of the universe needs to memorize the scientific method right now. It would just take a lot of like, um, you know, argumentation off the table. <laughs> if people just understood the difference between a hypothesis and a fact, you know, just that simple yeah. definition would make a big difference. But I love how you're, it's just such a great way to think through a lot of problems, including art problems and approaching art, like a problem to be solved is such a great, it's just such a great approach. I love it. Yeah. Fun, fun times. Um, you make me want to go draw something. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to, one of my, one of my goals is to journal, journal more. So maybe I'll have to add in some drawing. My son actually draws like that's his go-to when things get stressful, he sketches. And I think it's such a helpful tool because it, it does, it gets all the stuff out of your head. It helps you declutter. Mm -hmm. So you can just like breathe and reapproach whatever's bugging you. It's, it's just such a great thing. I think everybody should learn the basic skills of drawing at least and color theory too, because color is all around us and it affects everything. I mean, it's how we're designed to view the world. Yeah. I mean, just the scientific properties of light and absorption and reflection. And like, that's how God gave everything you're going to do to be viewed to you, like through color, man, I hope you learn to understand it a little bit because then it increases in value, yeah. like how exceptional that is that way our eyes work. <laughs> yeah. That's a great way to say it. I do think, um, I do think a little bit of understanding can really, it does increase the value for us, right? Because we start thinking all that goes into it and we get to like participate in God's creative process just by creating art or even understanding, having that wonder that goes with science. Mm -hmm. That's in my opinion, one of the greatest values of understanding science really truly is the world is full of wonder. And if you understand a little piece of it, wow, it's, it's just mind boggling. Um, this great world that we live in and what God did for us <laughs> by creating it and letting us live in it. That is so true because uh, the universe is one big scavenger hunt love letter from God. We use science to discover it. We use math to predict it. And we use art to portray it. And like, they're so interrelated. It's, they're just so interrelated. <laughs> I love that, PJ. A scavenger hunt love letter. That's true. That's so true. I'm going to have to make a meme. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna attribute it to you because that that is so <laughs> true. It is a scavenger hunt love letter. And the more you know about art and science and math, and these disciplines of um, study, it helps you really discover more and understand just how profound it is. So you guys, if you're looking for great art classes, BJ is your girl. <laughs> and I will post the links to all that you're teaching next year. Um, the catalog will go live next week and we're going to have summer classes posted too. So there's a lot, a lot to look forward to. BJ, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I like having these chats. Thanks for I asking me. <laughs> Thanks. And have fun with your dragon unit. That sounds like really fun, actually. <laughs> I love it. Okay, you guys, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us. Bye.